Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, hey, good morning, Rescue Church. I want to say welcome to each and every one of you in all of our locations. Thank you for being with us on this Sunday. You picked a great day to be in God's house with God's people. So in addition to everyone gathered here in Flandreau, let me say good morning to our campus over in Coleman, South Dakota. Hello to Deeside, Jamaica. Hello to Garrettson, South Dakota. Hello to our brand new Peoria Deaf Campus. Thank you for being with us. It's great having you guys on the team. Welcome to all of you on our iCampus. Welcome to the Slayton soon-to-be campus. Man, God's doing awesome stuff in our church, and I don't care where you're joining us from. You just picked a great day to be with us because God's doing fun stuff in the life of this church, and we're heading into some pretty cool places. So we're also heading into a really good message today. I hope uh, we are in week five of a series called Shape to Serve, and SHAPE is an acronym. I'll say this again. S stands for spiritual gift. The fact that God has given those of us who've put our faith and trust in Jesus unique spiritual gifts, different than others in the body of Christ, and the purpose of those spiritual gifts is to help build and grow the body of Christ and to serve one another. We've learned that H stands for the fact that God has given us all a unique heartbeat. There's things I care about and I'm passionate about and interested in that are different from the things that your heart cares about and is passionate about, and God wired you with a unique heartbeat unlike anyone else. The A stands for abilities. God has given us all unique talents and abilities and skills to do things to serve him and to serve other people. And it makes us unique. It makes us different. The P we talked about last week is our personality, that God has uniquely given each and every one of us a unique personality. And today we're going to drill down into another very important subject in this acronym. The E stands for our experiences. And we're going to learn today that God actually wants to use our past experiences as part of our shape. That's kind of the big idea today. And, and the whole big idea behind the entire series is this, that God has made you and me on purpose, for a purpose. Like he put us here because he wanted us here. He made us the way he wanted to make us because he has a job. He has good works for us to do and accomplish, to serve him, to serve other people. And it's good that you're different. And this whole series is about helping people understand how God has wired you uniquely different than anyone else on purpose for a purpose, because he has a plan for your life, and he wants to use you in a great way. Well, as we talk about the subject of experiences, like I said, I think this is one of those areas it's easy to overlook, and sometimes we forget the fact that our life is a special story. Like, all of the stuff in our past that has brought us up to this moment is unique. It's it's our story. No one else shares identically our exact same story. And what I, I hope to communicate today is this big idea that God wants to use those past experiences in my life as a way to, to make my shape. It's part of what forms me. All of the stuff in my life, the past stuff in my life, God uses that. It's like a chisel that he has used to, to mold me into a very unique shape that, that's unlike anyone else. And I want to pose the question this morning, like, what kind of experiences are we talking about? Like, what experiences are in my life and in your past that God uses to form your special shape? The the simple answer to that question is all of them. Like, God doesn't waste experiences in our past. Like, he uses all of it. It all matters. But I do want to draw your attention to a couple broad categories on your handout. If If you've got your handout and if you're following along with me, I want you this week, here's kind of some homework. I want you to just go somewhere where it can be quiet and you can have some time alone and just time to think. And I want you to evaluate primarily these four areas that I've listed on your handout because these these will definitely, I mean, there's others we could add to this list, but this will definitely get us thinking in the right direction. And hopefully, my goal today is that some of your eyes will be opened to to just how much God has done in your past or allowed things to happen in your past because he wants to use that in your future. So the one category that you'll notice I labeled on your handout is spiritual experiences. I want you to consider like what have been your your spiritual experiences in your past. 
Here, here's one question I just want to pose to everyone in the sound of my voice listening to this today is, is this. Do you have a salvation story? And if so, what is it? And what I mean by a salvation story is simply this. I'm talking about, can you look back to a point in your life when you kind of stepped across that line of faith and you say, it was at this point in my life, I gave my heart to Jesus. I believed in Jesus. I put my faith and trust in him. I came to believe and, and, and put my faith in the fact that he is who he claims to be. For some of you, that might be a, a very specific moment in time that you can point back to and remember. And for others, some of your testimonies, it's more of a process where over a, over a period of time, you, you kind of transition from a, your former way of thinking to now you've come to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but it wasn't just a, a one moment thing. It, it, it kind of took place over the course of time. But I, I still think it's important for you to think about that experience and to be able to articulate it because God wants to use that experience moving forward. And you need, I think the big idea under this category is you need to learn to recognize how God has been at work in your life. And I've got really good news for you. If you're here today and you would say, you know, I, I can't really point to an experience like that in my life yet. I don't think that's really there. What I want you to know is that it could be as soon as right now, as soon as today, you could put your faith and trust in Jesus and call upon him for the gift of eternal life, for the forgiveness of your sin. But can I just offer a baby step even before that? I had a really interesting conversation with a guy just this past week. And what I realized is that some, not everybody's ready just to take that step right now. So let me offer a baby step to that first major spiritual experience of accepting Christ into your life. Maybe you're here today and you still have doubts about all this Jesus stuff. And you're not really sure about all of the claims of the Bible and all of this. But I believe, I believe that deep down in your heart of hearts, you do believe there is a God. You know there is, even though there might be part of you that kind of wants to hope that that isn't the reality and maybe you want to suppress that. I believe most people deep in their heart, they really do believe there is a God who exists out there somewhere. Maybe the baby step for you in this idea of spiritual experiences would just simply be to offer up this simple prayer. To say, God, I don't even know fully if you're out there, but if you are, I'm just asking, would you please show yourself to me? And show me that you are real and that you really want a relationship with me and begin to reveal yourself. If what you say is true and if you really are the truth, would you help open my heart and my eyes and my mind to the truth? Because if you're there, I really want to know if all of this stuff is really real and just see what God might do in your life. See the relationships he might bring across your path. See what he might do. But that's a good, good starting point for spiritual experiences. How about baptism? I, I would ask that question. Do you have a baptism story? It's part of your spiritual experience. And, and it's important to be able to look back at that and see how God worked in your life. When did you get baptized? Where did you get baptized? Why did you get baptized? Why did you do it? You need to be able to articulate these experiences in your life because they're not there just for no purpose. God wants to use them. By the way, can I just scold our church for just a minute in a loving way? Uh, we, we launched this thing back at the end of 2015 when we, when we brought out our new vision statement. We, we built these cool little connection centers and we put them in, in most of our locations. And, uh, and one of the things we want to do through those connection centers is capture people's stories. Simple stories about how they came to know Christ as their Savior or how they're growing in their relationship with Jesus or ways that they're going and serving others in the name of Jesus. And, and here's the thing. I'm going to talk more about this at the end of my message today. I'm going to come back to this. But even just under this heading of baptism or your salvation story, I want to challenge you guys. Stop by your connection center. Grab one of these little cards. All it says is my story, and it's a big blank card that you can share your story. If it's nothing more than I got baptized at such and such a place on such and such a date, your story's powerful, and your experiences have been given to you by God because he wants to use you for a reason. So I'm saying, man, today, go fill out a story about how you got saved, how you accepted Christ, how you got baptized. We want to hear those stories. How about this one? Like, what, what times in your life could you point back to and say, man, I can really identify that during this time I took some steps of growth in my life, spiritually speaking. 
I mean, we, we want to continue to grow, but I don't believe that we just always grow up and to the right, you know? I believe that, that, that sometimes we're, we have seasons of, of growth that's more visible than others in our life. And can you look back to those and articulate, this is a way and a time that God was really working in my life. And, and maybe with that, I would ask the question, can you identify times in your life that God felt close to you? Like you just felt... Uh, that, that God was closer to you at that season in your life. What was going on? What were you experiencing? And the reason, again, this is so important is because it's helping you identify times and ways that God was really present and active in your life. He's always present in our life. There's just times that we recognize it more and we sense, he, we sense what he's up to more in our life. So that's one broad category, spiritual experiences. Here's another one I want to throw out at you is just vocational experience. What vocational experiences do you have in your past? And, and maybe another way of saying vocational experiences is, is your J-O-B, your job. Jobs you've loved in the past, jobs you've hated in the past, they're all there for a reason. And God can use every one of those former experiences that have brought you up to where you are right now. By the way, this week as I was preparing this, I, I wanted just to share a very practical resource. It's not maybe super spiritual sounding, uh, but, but it's, it's a practical resource that I want to throw at you. For those of you that might be struggling in your jobs, maybe, maybe I'm talking to some people that you're dreading Monday morning because you hate getting up and going to work. And, and maybe a series like this is beginning to expose just why you really can't stand your job. It's because you're starting to realize, I'm not shaped for that. And so this is not me telling you all to go quit your job tomorrow. That's not what you're hearing your pastor say. But I do want to give you a very practical resource. I've been following this guy. His name is Dan Miller. I wrote his information down on your handouts. But uh, Dan Miller is his name. I learned about him through Dave Ramsey. If you've ever heard of Dave Ramsey, he's kind of the financial peace guy talking about how to handle your money in a biblical way and, and how to prosper financially. But Dave Ramsey points people to this guy named Dan Miller. He's written several books called, one, one of his biggest ones called 48 Days to the Work You Love. He also has one called No More Mondays. He does a weekly podcast where, and, and I love his podcast because it, it, I'm not really looking for any more jobs, but I just love hearing people's stories about how they pursued their dreams and their passions in life and how now they're, they're blowing up their, at the job they're at or the business they've started. I love hearing people ask their questions and hear a coach speak into that. So anyway, if you're struggling, if any of that sounds interesting to you, it's just a practical way to go look at some of that and, and realize that God wants to use me in my work. Like we talked about this a few weeks ago. It's not that this church where we're sitting, this is sacred time, and then all of the rest of the week is somehow secular that God doesn't care about it. He cares about your vocation. And so what experiences have you had vocationally that have brought you up to this point? What have you learned from those experiences? Another area that I would really encourage you to consider as we look at our past experiences is what I would call your educational experiences. And, and by the way, don't hear in that what I'm not asking for is what is your highest level of formal education. I mean, certainly that counts and that matters. That's part of the discussion. You know, well, I, I dropped out of high school in the 10th grade. Okay, so be it. I would contend you didn't stop getting an education then. And I'm not asking if you have a degree from a prestigious university or a university at all, because the reality is that's not education in and of itself. It can be education. It's part of education. But, but the differentiation I want to make when we talk about educational experiences is I'm not just referring to a short period of time where you're sitting under formal instruction in a classroom setting. That certainly can be part of our education, but what I'm really talking about is a lifelong commitment to being a learner. And what have you learned in your past? What educational experiences have you had, regardless of whether or not they've come with a degree from a classroom or just from the school of hard knocks of life? What have you learned educationally? You know, and by the way, let me just speak this over, over this audience, like because maybe some of you can relate to where I'm at. When, when God called me into ministry, one of my greatest levels of insecurity, I had lots of them and still do, but, but one of my greatest levels of insecurity at that time as a young man was the fact that I did not have, quote, an education. 
because I was brought up to kind of think no one really taught me this formally. It was just, you know, the, the, the traditional background I came from. I was brought up to think that the only way you had an education was if you went off to seminary or Bible college and got a degree that claimed you had an education. And so I, that was a huge insecurity in my life, and people would question me about that. Well, how can you be a pastor without a Bible college degree or without seminary? And, and, and here's the thing. I'm not down on that at all. I mean, again, that's, that's a valid educational experience. But what I've come to learn is that there's a huge difference between simply having a degree and being a learner. I mean, I, I met people in my life, I can think of one individual in my life that, uh, that I, I met at one point that th this person had a master's degree and they were extremely proud of it. And you should be. I mean, you earned it. It's, it's hard work to get that. It's a big accomplishment. But like in their mind, their learning stopped the day they walked across that stage at graduation. They weren't, they weren't pursuing any more learning. You couldn't get this guy to pick up a book and read it ever, but he had a degree and he was very proud of it and he brought that into pretty much every conversation he had. He wanted people to know he had a master's degree, but he wasn't a learner so much. And, and I just am challenging you to evaluate what have you learned? What have been your educational experiences? What have you read? What have you listened to? And I want to challenge God's people as long as I'm on this soapbox right now. Like I'm just a passionate fan of people developing themselves and growing through learning, specifically through reading. And, and if you're one of those that say, I hate reading, I just, I don't read it. Okay, then let me ask you this question. If you're not a reader, what is your way of educating yourself? What is your way of growing and surrounding yourself with new thoughts, new ideas, new information, listening to people who you don't always agree with and listening to their worldviews and, and thinking critically about how, do I agree with that or not? I want to challenge God's people. Don't get lazy in life when it comes to learning. Be a learner because God wants to use those educational experiences to advance you to greater responsibilities in the future. But I don't believe God blesses laziness. So don't, don't stop learning just because you have a, a degree. Having a degree is not necessarily synonymous with having an education. So I hope I made my point really clear. I'm not just asking about what was your highest level of formal education. I'm asking what have you learned? And, and what are you continuing to learn as we talk about educational experiences? Finally, here's the fourth broad category, and then, then we'll get into the meat and potatoes today is this. And it's one that probably many of us would like to, to not talk about, to not think about, but I'm going to contend it's maybe one of the most important experiences in your past, and one of the most important categories, and that's painful experiences. And just me bringing up that word is enough to make some of you go, oh man, I don't even want to go there. But the minute I say it, like you automatically, you're taken right back to that thing in your past, to that very painful experience, to that loss, to that violation, to that hurt, whatever it was, that betrayal, that painful thing. And, and I just want to pose this question. What if... It's true that God never wastes any of that pain that's in our past. What if it's true that God actually wanted to use some of that? Not that he caused it, but that in his sovereignty, he allowed it, and, and, and he allowed it for a purpose, because what if he actually wanted to use that as part of your unique shape in order to serve him and to serve other people? And so we're going to drill down into that a little bit. I want to spend the rest of our time this morning basically asking the question, how does this work? Like, how does God use the stuff that's in my past to make a difference now and in the future? Like, why is this important for us to embrace my experience? That's the title of the message today. Why? How does it work? I mean, what does this look like when God takes the stuff that was in my past, whether it's spiritual experiences or vocational or educational or even painful stuff, to make a difference in the lives of other people right now. I want to suggest three things, and if you've got your handouts and you want to write them down with me, let's do it together. Here we go. Number one, I can use my past experiences to minister to others. What if, let me just ask this question for a moment, what if that, that point of pain and misery, that mess that's in your past, what if God wanted to take that mess and turn it into a great message for his glory through your life? 
What if he wanted to take that misery and turn it into a real ministry in the lives of other people, to take that trial and that test and to turn it into something beautiful that, that will impact the lives of other people? I believe that's exactly what God wants to do. What if, what if God wants to use that thing in your past like he did in the life of Joseph? I want to share this with you in Genesis chapter 50. If you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, it's way back in the Old Testament, the first book of the Bible. You should go read some of those chapters leading up to this verse. Because you're, when you realize all of the betrayal and the unfair circumstances that Joseph was dealt, like from the time he was young, he experienced a lot of things that were not fair. And I'm telling you, there's people in the sound of my voice, you can relate to this. Because you have dealt with things and struggled with things that you did not make the decision to be there. Someone else was responsible for that, and yet you were left with the mess. And yet, look at what Joseph says toward the end of his life when so much has played out, and now his brothers are standing before him, the very ones that, he had, that had sold him into slavery, had betrayed him, had lied about what happened to him. Now they're standing before him. He's been sold off into a distant land, but God blessed him. He was with him. He rose up to power. He's like number three in charge in all of Egypt. And here come his brothers bowing before him because there's a famine and they're hungry and they need food. And look at this when this moment comes. Look at the words of Joseph to his brothers. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And what if God allowed that thing to happen in your past because there are many lives that he wants you to save and to be a part of rescuing because he's going to turn that pain into something, a message that can, can minister to other people. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 1.4. He says, he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they, are, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Let me ask you to consider this. Who, who is more equipped, who is better equipped than to, to reach out and touch the life of someone who has suffered sexual abuse than someone who themselves has, has suffered sexual abuse in their past? Someone who can completely relate to where you're at and the guilt you feel and all of the, the stuff that goes with that. Who better to minister to that person? Who better to, to minister to a, a family that has just lost a child than someone else who has also experienced that pain and walked through that dark valley of the shadow of death only to come out on the other side experiencing God's faithfulness through the whole thing who can come alongside this other hurting family and say, you will get through this. In spite of the pain, God is still good. And there's going to be hard days, but you will make it. Who, who better to come alongside of someone who's experiencing a completely unfair divorce that they did not ask for a, a, other than someone who has been through that themselves and, and can say, man, I know what you're going through right now. And I'm not saying you have to experience all of that to minister to people, but what I am saying is that when you embrace those painful experiences in your past, you can be a powerhouse in terms of ministry in the lives of hurting people. But you know what? One of the steps is that you have, to, you have to be able to talk about that. And you have to be able to own the fact that that did happen in my past. And it's possible that right now on this weekend, God has brought someone here to the Rescue Church, to one of our locations. And maybe you're thinking about something right now in your, your mind that you have never told anybody about. And I would challenge you, what if this week were the week that you found someone in this church who's safe, who's trustworthy, who you could say, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And you sit down with that person and you say, what I'm getting ready to share with you, I've never told anybody. But back when I was 16, back when I was eight, you see, if here's the thing. If you don't let God use those painful experiences for good, all you get out of it is pain. All you get out of it is the pain of someone else's bad decisions or even maybe your own bad decisions. But if we choose to let God step into that and use that and just embrace the fact that he is going to take what Satan intended for evil and he's going to bring good out of it. 
And, and he, will, he will allow me to minister to others who are hurting and bring comfort to others. You get so much more than just the pain of a raw deal. You get to see God bring something beautiful out of something that was not beautiful. It's the promise of Romans 8, 28. And we looked at this a few weeks ago, but I just want to share it again in case you've never heard this or in case you need to remember this today. This is a promise from the Word of God. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose, we know, one of the translations says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That verse doesn't say that everything that happens to us is good. It just says that we serve a God who can take a crucifixion on a Friday and turn it into a resurrection on a Sunday. We serve a God who if we allow him, if we work with him through that process, he will take those painful, dark places in our past and he will elevate us to a place of ministry where we're bringing beauty into the lives of other people. That's why this stuff matters, to talk about our experiences and to get to the point where we can not hide from it in shame and embarrassment, but to be able to say, this happened to me. And maybe I was responsible for it. Maybe I had no responsibility for it. It was completely unfair, but it was something I had to deal with. God wants to use that experience. It's part of your shape. It's part of what makes you very uniquely you, and he'll use it if you let him. He, you can use those experiences to minister to other people. Here's another one, number two. I can use my past experiences to model to others. I can use my life as an example. I can use all of the stuff in my past, both the good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, the happy, the educational, the vocational, the spiritual. I can use all of my past experiences as a way to model for people. Some things good, some things maybe not so good, but look at what Paul says in Philippians 3, 17. He says, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. And on the front end, that may sound kind of arrogant for a spiritual leader to say that, but I don't think it's arrogant at all. I think what Paul understands is this. We all learn from modeling. We all learn from people around us. We watch what they do, and we, we repeat that. We imitate that. And so Paul is basically saying, I want you to watch what I do. And I want you to learn from me. And I want you to learn from the examples of others who are learning from me as well. You know, here's what a model is. If you think about a model airplane or a model car or a model anything, it, it's a smaller representation of the real thing. And think about that. As Christians, as Christ followers, that's, that's God's will for our life, that we would be smaller representations of the real thing, of Jesus. That there's all these little model Christs running around, acting like, living like, thinking like, reaching out, loving like the real Jesus because he lives in us. And we don't do it perfectly because we're not Jesus, but, but we, are, we are modeling him for the rest of the world around us. And here's the deal. We can learn from other people's modeling in our life. Can I, can I give you one of the greatest recipes for success? It's so simple and it's so important. Here it is. If you want to be successful, and I don't care what the area is, it doesn't matter. You fill in the blank. If you want to be successful, go find someone that is winning in whatever area you desire to win in in your life and learn from them. You can learn from them at a distance by reading what they write, by listening to what they produce. You can learn by them, from them up close by being in relationship and asking them questions directly. Find someone who's winning in the area. You want to have a great marriage? Find someone in this church who's have, who has a great marriage, who you want to model after and say, can, can we just take you out for lunch and, and learn what is it that, that you have done over the years to get to where you are now? Learn from their modeling. You, you want to learn from someone who's winning with their money and their finances? Sit down with them and ask them, how do you do this? I want to model my life after you in this area. Because modeling is powerful. And so our experiences in the past can be used for modeling to others, both lessons you should do and maybe things you should not do. I, I would contend that you and I don't have enough time in our lives to make all of the mistakes that everyone else has made in the world. 
it, it, it's a lot easier to learn from those mistakes and to model from them and say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. And, and I want to speak this over especially some of the young people in our church. And, and even if you're not so young of a person, this, this still counts. Because this is a reality we just need to embrace when we talk about the subject of modeling. The truth is, is that we don't get to choose our models when we're young. We don't. We don't get to choose our families. And, and for better or worse, a marriage counselor one time shared with me and Jessica, he, here's the, 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 the words he used, is that your family of origin essentially gives you a roadmap to follow for your life, for your marriage, for how you handle money, for how you deal with kids, for what you do when you're angry in traffic. Like, you get a roadmap handed to you. Not formally, not, not on purpose. It's just picked up through the power of modeling. And the sad reality is you don't get to pick those models. So for better or worse, you are handed a roadmap to follow as you head out into life. And, and, and some of us, we've got positive things we can follow and we picked up. And, and some of us, we have some really warped, negative roadmaps in front of us that we need to get rid of. And here's the good news is that you hit a point in your life that you now get to choose who your models are. You didn't get to choose it early on, and maybe because of that, you, you, got, you got set down a path that was not healthy at all. It was dysfunctional. The good news is, as you get older, you get to take responsibility for your life, and you get to choose who your role models are and who you're going to follow. So find someone who you respect, find someone who's winning in life, who's following Jesus, who's loving God well, who's leading their family and, and doing family well, who's handling their finances well, learn from them. And what if God wanted to use your experiences to model to others? That's why this stuff about our experiences matter. I would encourage you, find someone that you respect to model your life after. And then the third thing, it kind of goes hand in hand with modeling. Here's another way that God can use our past experiences. I can use my past experiences not only to model, but to mentor others. And, and, and there's kind of a difference between modeling and mentoring. In some way, they go hand in hand. But, but mentoring has this idea that it's more up close, it's more personal, it's more relational. Like, I know my mentor. I can, I can model after anybody, but my mentor, I really get to know relationally, and I get to know them well. And I want to contend that God wants all of us, first of all, to have mentors in our life. And then I also want to contend that God wants all of us to be mentors in our life where we're pouring into the next generation, into others around us. I want to speak briefly to two categories of people. And, and for lack of a better word, I'm just going to call it like it is. I want to talk for a minute to young people, and I want to talk to old people. Okay? I want to start with the young crowd, and I want to show you something the Word of God says. And I think it plays into this idea of mentoring and seeking out mentors in our life. This comes from the book of Job. Job chapter 8, verse 8. The word of God says this, just ask the previous generation. Pay attention to the experience of our ancestors. Hey, young people, that's for you. That's for us. I'm going to say us because I still want to put myself in that category. That is saying that for those of us who are young, we need to pay attention to the experiences of our ancestors. And by the way, I wouldn't encourage you as church is dismissing today to go find one of the elderly people in church and, and call them your ancestor, all right? That may be a little harsh, okay? But, but what this is saying, if I can just be real for a second, we live in a culture right now that devalues our senior citizens, that devalues gray hair. And when we see somebody walking around with a head full of gray hair and they're hunched over and they're walking slowly with a cane, we live in a culture that wants to marginalize that and somehow look down on that and say, you've had your time. You are a has-been. You are washed up. You have nothing more to offer. And that is completely disrespectful and it's completely foolish. How foolish of a younger generation to look at the, the wisdom that comes from our ancestors using the Bible's word, from the generation that has gone on before us. How foolish to look at all of that and in arrogance say, we don't need that. There's nothing you can teach us. The Bible's telling young people here, you need to learn from the experiences of the generations that have gone on before you. 
And I'll tell you what, this, this was driven home to me. Uh, I, I remember very specifically growing up, I mean, I, I was brought up in a house where we were taught to respect uh, the elderly and, and to have respect for that generation. But I'll tell you, when it really sunk in in my own life as a young adult, I, I was probably like 21, 22 maybe, and I was reading uh, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation which is just stories of the generation of, of young men that went off and fought during World War II and at, at the age of 17, 18, 19 years old and the horrible things they endured on the battlefield as they fought for not only our freedom as a nation but fought to, to conquer evil that was on a rampant rise in the world at that time. And then they came back and they stuffed so much of what they had seen on, in the battlefield, just suppressed it, and they went on to live their lives, and they built a country that, that we've come to know and enjoy, and freedoms that we just take for granted. And what I realized as I read that book, I mean, at, at the time of that reading, these guys were way old, and they're dying. I mean, that generation is almost completely gone. And what I realized as I read the stories about the things they had endured as young men, I realized this generation has something to teach us. Every generation has something to mentor and to pass on to the up-and-coming younger generation. But check this out. To the old people, can I say to the ancestors? All right, here's another word from the book of Job. Job 32, 7 says, I thought those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. See, there's a two-way street here. The responsibility is both ways. The younger crowd needs to listen and be humble and, and open to what the older crowd has to teach us. But the older crowd, i got to tell you something. you got to speak. According to the Word of God, you need to come alongside of the younger generation and speak wisdom into our lives because we need the experience that you have. We don't have all of that lifetime of experience, so you got to teach us. And, and we need to humble ourselves and we need to listen to that. And, and real quick, I want to flip back to the younger crowd because here's the thing. I don't want you to think that the only way to be a mentor is to be old. Because the reality is all of us can be a mentor to someone in our life. As I said, I believe God wants us all to be mentored and learn from other people's experiences. And I think he wants us all to be mentors to others and let him use our experiences to shape them as well. And, and so here's the word to young people. This just came to my mind. I love this verse. I used to lean on it even more when I was young in ministry. This is the Apostle Paul speaking into the life of a young pastor by the name of Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He says this to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. That's not, that's not a bad thing to be young. We're all there at one point. So, so don't look down. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The bottom line, Timothy, you have a story that other people can learn from. You have experiences that other people can learn from. It doesn't matter how old you are. God doesn't need you to be a certain age to impact. Your experience matters, whether it's a short experience or a very long lifetime of experience. There are people who can learn and be mentored from and, be, and model after and be ministered to through your experiences that are in your past, young and old alike. And here's how I kind of want to wrap this up today. I'm going to come back to this story card. I said I was going to come back to this theme. I just want you to understand that your experiences matter because it's part of how God has formed you and shaped you. And I want to challenge our church. Share your story with others. And here's the thing. I'm not really scolding you guys about not sharing your stories. I think there's two major things going on here. And maybe there's more, but here's two big things I see. One, one reason I think that these cards are slow in coming in is because, uh, because we're humble. I mean, most of us are, right? And so most of us say, I don't want to brag on myself, and I don't want to go write a story about how I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus or how I'm going and serving others. It feels like I'm bragging and putting myself on a pedestal for other people to look at. Hey, remember, we just read Paul where he told a bunch of Christians to model themselves, pattern their lives after me. How are the younger Christians supposed to know how to do it if some of us aren't modeling? So don't be afraid to share your story. But I think that's one reason is we feel like, oh, you know, it's going to be arrogant if I say that. The other thing 
The other thing is, I think often we don't recognize the power that our story has, and we don't think it's that big of a deal. Oh, it's no big thing. I just went and served in this way, or, you know, God kind of showed me this from his word, and I feel like I, I grew as a result of, of understanding this, or, you know, whatever decision it might be, we don't think it's that big of a deal. And what I hope you're starting to see, God says the exact opposite about your experiences. He says it's a big deal, and I want to use all of it. And you're sitting in a church that's trying to capture and share your stories because there are other people who will be encouraged and, and, and be inspired to take similar steps of growth in their life as you share your story. So share your story. One more verse. Let me summarize all of this, this conversation with this. Philippians 1.12, Paul says this. I think this is a good, good ending point. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Paul's saying that what I want you to know is that everything that's happened in my life up to this point, the painful stuff, all the education, Paul was a very smart guy, very educated, all of my experiences, he was a tent maker, you know, to support himself, he had a, he had a vocational job outside of ministry, he wasn't a full-time minister of the gospel. He's saying all of my experiences have served to advance the gospel. Because guess what? Here's why this talk about our experience matters. Here's why this talk about shape, this entire series matters. is because God has made you on purpose, for a purpose, and at the heart of that purpose, it's about advancing the message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that we were lost in our sin, but God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to come and give his life on a cross to pay the penalty of our sin. And as I've said, every week in this series, ultimately the key to really discovering your shape and, and waking up to who it is God created you to be, you need to know your shaper. You need to have a personal faith relationship with the one who created you and designed you and formed you and shaped you. And I just want to say before I close in prayer, if you're here today in any one of our locations and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why not now? Why not now, in the next few minutes as I close out in a word of prayer from wherever you're sitting, I challenge you just to put your faith in Jesus, believe in his name, and with your heart, with your mouth, call upon him and say, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and to save me from my sin and to be my Lord, to be my Savior. Today, I want to start this relationship with you. And the Bible promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I challenge you to do that. Right now, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given to us. Lord, thank you for this awesome opportunity that I have to get to stand here and share your word with the people that you love so much. And thank you that you loved us enough to give us a unique design, a unique shape, on purpose, for a purpose. God, I thank you that you don't waste the experiences in our past. Thank you that you don't waste our hurts our vocational experiences, our educational experience, Lord, the, the spiritual things that we've experienced in our life, it's all there because you want to use it. And my prayer is that you would truly be waking up the hearts of your people in this church, that we would understand we're not just going through the motions, taking the path of least resistance through this life, but that we have been put here on this earth to make a real difference for your kingdom and that you'd be showing us how you've uniquely wired us to do that. Lord, I pray right now, if there's anyone in any of our locations who do not know you to be their Lord and Savior, that right now, today would be their day of salvation, that in this moment, they would be putting their faith in you and calling upon you. Jesus, we give you all of the, the praise, the honor, and the glory for how you use this message in our lives, in our churches, in our communities. It's in your mighty name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com. If you'd like to share how God spoke to you through this message, we'd love to hear from you. Just send your stories to therescuechurch at hotmail.com. If this message has blessed you, you can support the ministry of the Rescue Church by giving online at our website under the Donate tab.